I'd like to begin this morning by asking you a question. And that question is that if you knew what time tomorrow Jesus Christ was returning to earth, how would you live your life today? If you knew without a shadow of a doubt that Christ would be here tomorrow, how would it change the way you're living today? The answer to that question is the very thing that you need changed. In our text today, we find a surprising answer to that question. The New Testament constantly exhorts us to live in light of the sure return of Christ. And in our sequential exposition of 1 Peter, we arrive this morning at a paragraph that answers that question from, or with an answer rather, that is not the way I would naturally answer the question. And perhaps it's not the way you would answer the question either. Our text for this morning is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Would you please follow along as I read? The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Our Father, as we now come before you to receive the food of your holy word, we ask for your Spirit's illumination so that Christ might be lifted high and so that we might be changed and act in accordance to your word so as to bring you glory. Lord, we pray that you would open your word to us and change us as a result of studying your word together this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This paragraph, verses 7 through 11, is the conclusion to the main body of text in the book of 1 Peter. And verse 11 serves as what's called an inclusio. An inclusio is essentially the same concept given two times that brackets together a section of Scripture. This section began back in chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Would you please turn there? We began this section of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. And in verse 12, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Paul reminded the recipients of this letter, rather Peter reminded the recipients of this letter, that they are aliens and strangers. They're foreigners. They don't feel at home in this world. They are citizens of another kingdom. And to the world, they're strange. They're strangers. And he instructs us and the recipients of this letter on how we are out to live as aliens and strangers. He says in verse 12, we're to keep our behavior excellent among the Gentiles, all for the purpose of glorifying God. And then in chapter 4, turn back to chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, This section closes with the second half of verse 11, which says, So that in all things God may be glorified. Verse 12, to glorify God. Verse 11, to glorify God through Christ Jesus. 
This concludes the main body, and we'll move on to a different subject in verse 12. But for now, it's important to remember what the purpose of the section is. The purpose is living a life as an alien and stranger that brings glory to God during your stay on earth. In verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4, Peter told us, and we noted last week, that focusing on our future helps us cope with suffering in a holy and godly way rather than dealing with suffering in this world by running back to our old way of life. Let's read verse 1 of chapter 4 through verse 6 to make sure that we have the context firmly fixed in our minds. Therefore, since Christ also suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. After describing Christ's purpose to descend to the world, Christ descended to this world and then he condescended to the cross, knowing that he came to suffer. Peter then exhorts us as aliens and strangers to have the mind of Christ, meaning to embrace suffering in a world where we're aliens and strangers for the purpose of bringing glory to God, just as Christ embraced suffering for the purpose of bringing glory to God. Peter then in verse 2 says, So live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the less of men, but for the will of God. Peter has told us through chapter 3 that we should expect suffering and that it is the will of God for us as believers to suffer. But because we are sinful, we are prone to deal with the stress of our suffering by retreating into our old way of life. When you're stressed out, do you reach for the bottle? Or do you pull up the internet and look at that thing that you shouldn't be looking at? How are you dealing with the stress of the suffering of the Christian life? Peter says, arm yourself. Literally, put on the same mind of Christ and prepare to suffer, as Paul says, as a good soldier in Christ Jesus, rather than returning to your old way of life. He says in verse 3, For the time is already past is sufficient, for you would have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And all of this they are surprised, meaning the world, that we don't run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign us for it. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Notice what Peter's doing. He's saying, look, Arm yourself with the same mind of Christ. And the reason you need to arm yourself with the same mind of Christ, meaning preparing to suffer for God's glory in this world, is because there is a future fixed day of judgment for all of those who are not in Christ in verse 5. And then he makes a comment about those who have died in Christ and are now in the intermediate state in verse 6. Now, the reason I went back and kind of gave us a running start on this passage is because in verses 1 through 6, Peter told us that focusing on our future helps us cope with suffering in a holy way rather than dealing with suffering by running back to our old way of life. But in the passage before us, he tells us that focusing on our future not only helps us to embrace suffering, knowing that the end of all things results in judgment or entering into the eternal state with the Lord, he tells us that focusing on our future helps shape, listen to this, focusing on our future helps shape the way we act and behave within the local church. It's one of our core distinctives at Revolve Bible Church is church membership. And the reason that that's one of our core distinctives is because we want to actively fight against the consumerism that is pervasive in the American evangelical church. Because of the seeker-friendly movement that really erupted in the 1990s, we've created droves upon droves of people that think that the church is a place that they go to simply to download information. But that's not the picture that the New Testament paints of the church. The church is God's household. The church is God's body. The church is God's temple. We are an interconnected group of believers. We're a family. 
Church membership is simply our effort to try to help people embrace their commitment, the commitment that God calls every person to, to the local church. Here in this passage, Peter answers the question that we began with this morning. If you knew that Jesus Christ was returning tomorrow, how would you live your life today? Peter's answer, I would serve the church with more passion. Is that what your answer would be? If you knew that Jesus Christ was returning tomorrow at 3 o'clock, would you immediately conclude, I'm going to go serve the church? But that's what Peter's whole point is here. Before we jump in and work our way through the text, I'd just like to point out a phrase that's used three times in these five verses. And that phrase is, one another. One another. Notice in verse 8, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Notice verse 9, be hospitable to one another. Then in verse 10, as each of you has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another. I have three points for you this morning. I'd like to give them to you at the outset. These are hooks to hang your thoughts on as we work through this passage. Number one, I want you to notice the provocation, the provocation. Number two, the particulars, the particulars. And number three, the purpose, the purpose. Let's begin then with point number one, which is in the first half of verse seven, which is the provocation. Or, to say it another way, our motivation to love and serve the church. Our motivation to love and serve the church. Notice verse 7. The end of all things is near. The end of all things is near. Notice the word end. This is the Greek word telos. This word is not only used to describe a chronological conclusion, but one lexicon tells us that originally it meant the culminating point at which one stage ends and another begins. The goal. Notice also not only the word end, but the word near in verse 7. The end of all things is near. This comes from the Greek verb engizo, which means to draw near in a temporal sense to draw near in a temporal sense. What does Peter mean here by saying that the end or the goal of all things is near? Well, as one commentator correctly wrote, this means that all the major events of God's plan of redemption have occurred and now all things are ready for Christ to return and rule. In other words, this is a reference to Christ's second coming. We are awaiting the final stage of God's redemptive plan. After Christ resurrected, he then ascended to sit on his Father's throne, according to Revelation chapter 3. And he is now in heaven, ruling and reigning, sitting on his Father's throne, awaiting a time when he will return, awaiting the time that his enemies will be made a footstool with under, under his feet. Acts 3, verses 19 through 21 says, Therefore, repent and return, this is Peter preaching, so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ, Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven, listen to this, must receive until the period of restoration of all things, which is which God spoke about by the mouth of the holy prophets in ancient times. Peter, referencing Christ, says Christ is now ascended to the Father and he is now waiting for the period of restoration of all things, meaning his second coming. Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. He's going to appear a second time to save his bride, to permanently unite her with himself, and to judge all those who are in opposition to him. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 13, tells us about the second coming of Christ. And we read, 
through the lips of the Apostle John or the pen of the Apostle John. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up their dead which were in them, and, the, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. I tricked you. That's not the second coming of Christ. That's the great white throne of judgment. But nonetheless, that's going to happen at the end of the age. Here, Peter is referencing the second coming of Christ for the purpose of motivating our love and commitment to one another. The Lord's return is used repeatedly in the New Testament to provoke us to live holy and godly lives. As Christians, we live in a state of expectancy waiting for our Lord's return. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. I'll do a little Bible study with you just to fix some of this in your mind and we'll come back to the passage we're in. Matthew chapter 24. Beginning in verse 37, we read, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away so will the coming of the Son of Man be. According to Genesis chapter 6, how long did it take Noah to build the ark? 120 years. They didn't know what rain and floods were at that time. So they see Noah building this boat in the middle of dry land for 120 years. And that picture was given to them for so long to quicken them about the reality of God's sure judgment. Jesus here uses that and likens it to his second coming. That when he returns, the world will not be prepared. The church has warned the world, we continue to warn the world, and we will continue to warn the world until Christ returns. But people will blow us off. Christ will come suddenly, just as the flood came suddenly after the completion of the ark. Turn to Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 11, Paul writes, Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep for now salvation is nearer to us than we first believed. Stop right there. If you're a Christian, you're already saved. You've been justified. You've been born again. You're regenerate. You've been sanctified. You've been set apart. You've already, in a sense, been glorified. But our glorification has not yet been realized. Where Paul says here, for our salvation is nearer than we first believed, He's talking about the culmination of our salvation, meaning our glorification, which recur occurs at the return of Christ. Verse 12 of Romans 13, The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, nor in sexual promiscuity or sensuality, not in strife or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lusts. Focusing on the sure second return of Christ should motivate you to make no provision for the flesh. Amen. Thanks, John. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul once again references the second coming of Christ... And notes how it should motivate us. Beginning in verse 4 of Philippians chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, I say again, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Why? Because the Lord 
is what? He's near. In other words, the next event in God's prophetic timeline is the second coming of Christ. Because the Lord is near, we should be happy. We should be a people that are joy-filled because we know that we're just passing through and we're eagerly longing to be with our great King and our Savior. And so we try to be gentle. We're sinners. We're not always as gentle as we should be. We are simultaneously just and sinful. But understanding the second coming of Christ should motivate us to gentleness. And by the way, this is the connection I want you to see. Verse 6, be anxious for what? You heard this verse before, haven't you? Anytime you're struggling with anxiety, what does somebody do? They grab their Bible, they open it, they take you to Philippians 4, verse 6, and they say, be anxious for... But did you notice the connection as to why? Because the Lord is what? Near. Let me tell you why don't you got to worry a whole lot about what's going on in this life. Because it's all going to end. Because all of your problems and all of your difficulties and all of the things that get you all worked up, they're going to be gone. And they're going to be swallowed up in love and mercy and kindness by our Lord. And there's coming a day when every tear will be wiped and every sorrow that you're going through will be gone. Don't be anxious. The Lord is near. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things, these the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. His return is near and he is with you spiritually. 1 Thessalonians 5.2 says, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Similar to that text in Matthew chapter 24, it will come as a surprise. Revelation 22.20 we read, he who testifies of these things says, yes, this is speaking of Christ. Yes, I am coming quickly. And the church responds by amen, come Lord Jesus. In Aramaic, Maranatha. You ever heard that, Maranatha? That's what that means. It's an Aramaic word that the church adapted to remind itself that this world will grow strangely dim as we meditate on the sure return of our Lord. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Turn back to 1 Peter. The end of all things is near. This verse has been used by critics of Christianity to say that the Bible is not true. Ha! The end of all things is near. Ryan, Peter wrote this about 30 to 35 years after Jesus ascended to be with the Father. And here we are in 2020. It's been 2,000 years and Jesus still has not come back. Oh yeah, Jesus is near. Well, Peter's got an answer for that as well. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. Just a page or two over in your Bible. Beginning in verse 3 of chapter 3, know that first of all, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking following their own lust. Notice the source of mocking, their own lust. And saying, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Oh, oh yeah, Jesus is going to return. Yeah, really. For when they maintain this, Peter says, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. They said the same thing in the time of Noah for 120 years. Oh yeah, sure, no, it's going to flood. No, it's been 50 years. It hasn't flooded. Okay, no, it's been 100 years. It hasn't flooded. Okay, no, it's been 119 years. It hasn't. Okay, sure, Noah, 120 years. Boom. 
Verse 7. By his word, the present heavens and earth being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And then Peter explains his reasoning. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. In other words, God's timing and our timing is different. When will Christ return? Answer, no one knows. Christ said that is for the Father and the Father alone to know. Any time, listen, every 10 years, some crazy guy comes out saying that he knows when Jesus is going to come back. Listen, you can take it to the bank. No, he doesn't. Anytime someone tells you Jesus is coming, ignore it. No one knows. What we do know is it's near. Meaning it's the next event in the unfolding plan of God as revealed in Scripture. It's the next event in history in God's prophetic timeline. God's timing is not like our timing. One day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. Meaning it could be thousands and thousands of years or it could be tomorrow. And then Peter says this, the Lord is not slow about His promise. Why? Because here's the question in my mind, and I don't know if it's a question in yours, but the question then becomes, well, why hasn't Christ come? I mean, if we're longing for that day, and if that day is something that's so important for the believer, why hasn't He come? Well, Peter answers that in verse 9. He says, the Lord is not slow about His promise as some count slowness, meaning his promise to return. And here's the answer, because he's patient toward you. Paul says in Romans that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. By the way, I'm just shooing away a fly. That has nothing to do with my sermon. It is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. Peter describes this kindness as God allowing time to pass. Now think about this for a moment. I have many family members that don't know Christ yet. And I'm praying and evangelizing and hoping that one day God will bring them to himself. For that reason, I'm glad Christ has not returned. For selfish reasons, I want to be with the Lord. It's Death is gain. I'd rather die and be present with him. I'd rather not die and just have him come. But nonetheless, my heart wants to be with the Lord. But at the same time, we can know that the reason He hasn't come is because He's patient, waiting for those who are His to come. I want you to notice a very important thing here. He says, God is patient toward who? Look at the text. Read it with me. God is patient toward who? Everybody say you. All right. Now, why that's important is he's speaking to the recipients of his letter. Are, his, are the recipients of this letter Christians or not Christians? They're Christians. He's saying he's patient toward who? You. And then notice, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, do you see the word any or the word all? Do you see that? People use this verse to refer sometimes to some type of universalism. That God is in heaven and he's, he's just really hoping that, uh, that some people won't perish and he's really hoping that all will come to repentance. Well, that interpretation shows ignorance of simply the English language, not even the original language of the text. Notice again the word you. In literary form, that's called an antecedent. An antecedent is a word that precedes other words that inform the meaning of the next words. Does that make sense? So look back at the text. Not wishing for any. Who is the any? Not wishing for any of you, but wanting all of you to come to repentance. This is not God up in heaven simply saying that He's waiting and wanting everyone in the world as Jude said, some are destined for destruction. Peter actually made that comment earlier in the letter as well. The point here is, is that he's patient toward the church. 
when someone comes to Christ tomorrow, they get added to the church, the church universal. Maybe not Revolve Bible Church, right? The point here is that the reason why Christ has not returned is because the fullness of his bride has not yet come in. There are still more people from every tribe, tongue, and nation that Jesus has that he will bring into his fold. Who are those people? We don't know. We keep evangelizing. We speak. God saves. That's how it works. When the last person in God's redemptive plan is saved, Christ will return. He's patient. He hasn't come because he's waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in. Back to 1 Peter. You're like, Ryan, you keep taking us back to 1 Peter and we don't stay in 1 Peter. We'll try to now. Verse 7. The end of all things is there is near. Here we go. Here's the application. Therefore, in light of that, in light of the reality of the sure coming of Christ, this brings us to point number two, do this. Here are point number two, the particulars. The particulars. We notice the provocation or the motivation, but now that we understand that he's, his coming is near, what are we to do? And Peter gives us four things. I was going to say three, but I'm going to make them four. I'll make it clear in the text. Number one, prayer, love, hospitality, and service. So what's your list? If you knew Christ was returning tomorrow, what would you say that you should do? Pray, love, practice hospitality, and serve. That's Peter's list. Notice the text, verse 7. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. The phrase, be of sound judgment, comes from the Greek word sophroneo, and it is defined as to be prudent with focus on self-control, to be reasonable, sensible, serious, or to keep one's head. The phrase sober of spirit is a word that has a similar meaning, but it literally means to not be intoxicated or to be well-balanced or self-controlled. The application is, is that we need to be disciplined, not intoxicated, for the purpose of prayer, because we understand that Jesus is coming again. This teaches us that prayer requires self-control. If you and I are going to have vibrant and effective prayer lives, we must schedule time to get alone with God and pray. We have to put effort into it. We have to be serious about our prayer lives. That's what these words teach us. Prayer requires self-control. Prayer is hard work. Peter learned this lesson in how his flesh works against his prayer life in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter probably said this because the reality of the difficulty of praying was something Peter would probably never forget. Do you remember when Peter and Jesus were in the Garden of Gethsemane with the other disciples? In Mark chapter 14, verses 13 through 42, Jesus tells the disciples to pray, and he goes away a little bit and begins to pray. That's when he is, his soul is deeply grieved to the point of death, right before him going to the cross, where Jesus asked the Father if it is possible to remove that cup from him. And he then, after telling the disciples to pray, comes back and in verse 37 of Mark 14, finds Peter sleeping. Mark says in 1437, and he, that is Jesus, came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went again, away again and prayed, saying the same words. And he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? That is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Peter, the night before Christ was crucified, learned a hard lesson about prayer. And that is, it does not happen without great self 
control. Instead of praying at the most important hour, he fell asleep. You ever try to pray and fall asleep? I have. You ever tried to schedule a time to pray and found your flesh finding a million reasons why you shouldn't go do that? Because we get alone to pray and we don't hear God speak to us audibly. And sometimes we're tempted to think, is this even working? Is God even listening to me? To pray is a spiritual discipline, but it takes great self-control. It results in great blessing. In fact, it's the chief way that we abide in Him. And apart from Him, we can do nothing. It's us exercising our dependence upon Him. If you knew that Christ was coming tomorrow, would the first thing that you did this afternoon would be to go home and pray. That's what Peter says we should be doing. Secondly, love. We'll do this real quick here because I'm getting some bobbing for apples. Or as Jesus said to Peter, heavy eyelids. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, verse 8, because love covers a multitude of sins. Love is also what we are to do in light of His second coming. Loving one another is difficult. You know why loving each other is so difficult? Actually, let me just say it another way. You know why loving me is so difficult? Ask my wife. The answer would be because he's hard to love. Do you know why you're hard to love? Listen, do you, have you figured that out yet? That you are very hard to love? And you know why that is? Because you're a sinner. That's why we have to constantly be exhorted in Scripture to love one another. And loving one another, look at verse 8, it says it should be a priority, above all. It should be a priority of your life when you think of the second return of Christ to love God's people. And it's not just a, a lackadaisical love. It's, notice verse 8, it's a fervent love. This word means tense, resolute, eager, or to say it another way, aggressive it's aggressively loving one another. Above all. And then Peter tells us why. Because love covers a multitude of sins. The word covered means to hide, conceal, or throw a veil of oblivion over. Proverbs 10:12 says, "Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions." Listen, if you and I are going to stay together for any length of time, if you're going to stay married, if you're not going to kick the kids out of the house because of their sin, now, there's a point that that's necessary. My mom did it to me. It was the greatest thing that ever happened. All right, that's for another time. Love, listen, if we're going to stay together as a church, covers a multitude of sins. Why? Because... To love each other means that we don't grind one another every time we sin. Instead, it covers the person's sin. It throws a veil of oblivion over it. To love one another is to not nitpick one another. Now, the Bible does say that there are times when we have to to point out sin in one another's lives. The Bible says we're to take the log out of our own before we pick the speck out of our brothers, Jesus taught us. We are to practice church discipline when the sin is egregious and it's unrepentant for the purpose of restoration and helping our brother or sister get beyond that particular sin. But listen, when the sin is not unrepentant, when the sin is not chapter and verse, when the sin is not egregious, there are different classifications of sin as far as some being worse than others. We don't grind each other on every point where we fail. You can't have a relationship with someone for any length of time if that's how you treat other people. 
We, listen, we cover each other's sin. That's what love does. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 13 that we owe it to each other. He says, owe nothing to anyone except to love the brethren. And he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Not only that, Paul says in Galatians 5, chapter 13 through 15, listen, if you don't love each other, you're going to destroy this church. I am so passionate about this because it really goes in, it goes with combating the consumerism in the church. So many people think of the church like this. I'm going to go to that church because I really like that Bible teacher and I really like that music. And their children's ministry program, man, it is off the hook. It does so much for my family. You're like a spiritual glutton and that just reveals you have no idea what the church is. We are not simply consumers. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians that it is the pastor's job, listen to this, to equip the body to do the work of the ministry. My job's to equip. It's your job to keep the church together. Amen, Pastor Dave. Do you understand that? In fact, Paul says, listen to this in Galatians 5.13, that if you don't love each other, you're going to destroy our church. Not Pastor Ryan. Listen, I can be the most faithful preacher in the world, and you can still destroy this church. Not only do I have to take ownership in what God has called me to do to exercise my gift in the body, but you have to take ownership to do what God has called you to do to exercise your gift in this body or the body that God calls you to. Paul says in Galatians 5, 13 through 15, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Listen to this. But through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Listen to this. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. The word consumed comes from a Greek word, analo, and it is defined as to destroy with the possible implication of something being used up. If you don't love each other, you're instead you're going to start biting each other. I don't like this, and 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 I don't like this. And you know what's going to happen? All those little bites, you're going to eat the church. You're going to destroy it. You're going to consume it. Listen, when people sin against us, we got to say, that's all right. I love you. And rather than get my pound of flesh, I'd rather have a relationship with you. I'd rather us be friends. This is how we're to live in light of Christ's return. I was going to take us through 1 Corinthians 13, but I'll spare that for you. Back to the text. Keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. How are we to conduct ourselves in the household of God? What are the particulars? Look at verse 9. Be hospitable. Be hospitable. This word hospitable it literally means to be kind to strangers. And the context is referring not to strangers who are outside the church, but notice verse 9, be hospitable to what? One another. You know what that means? Look, everybody stop. Everybody with me? Just, I know, I don't, hey, I know this is the second sermon of the morning. Hang with me. If you're new, sorry, this is how we roll at Revolve Bible Church. Um, remember, love me. Love overlooks a multitude of sins. All right. <laughs> hey, just look at each other. Everybody just do me a favor. Just turn and look and just peek around. Okay. You see anybody you don't know? You're called to be hospitable to them. It means welcome strangers, but not strangers that are outside of this church. It's referring to people that are in the church that you don't know. Be hospitable to one another. Now, the context of this Back in the first century, think about this, Peter is writing to aliens and strangers, Christians that have been dispersed throughout the Roman Empire, modern day Turkey, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, and they're going into a new land, they're in a new place, and they're in the Roman Empire, and people are coming and going, people are coming and going, and Peter's saying, listen, you are to be hospitable, open your life up, bring them into your home, share what you have with them, all these other believers that you do not know. That's the idea. Be hospitable to one another. And then notice it says what? Without 
You see, we're really good at being hospitable as long as it doesn't cost us anything. But the moment it costs me something, I don't want to do that. Without complaint. Without complaint. I had so much more to say, but I got to land this plane. <laughs> Lastly, I want you to notice the service we are to have in light of the Lord's return. And we find that in verses 10 and 11. We're going to run through this, and this will be a great thing to discuss and go over in your life groups this week. If you're not in a life group, we have a large percentage of our church in life groups. We want to encourage you to get involved in one. Uh, the questions are on the back table. If uh, you're not in a life group, you can show up at one, but you're always welcome to take one of these as well. This week in life groups, we want to encourage you to discuss your spiritual gifts because Peter references them here. Quickly now, verse 10. As each has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good servants of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves it is to do so with the one who is serving by the strength with God supplies, so in that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever. We see a couple things about spiritual gifts here. Number one, gifts are for everyone. Notice verse 10. Each one has received a gift. If you are here this morning and you're a Christian, God has supernaturally gifted you to serve Him. Every single Christian, every single regenerate believer, and these aren't natural gifts, these are supernatural gifts that bring glory to God. Every single Christian has received a gift. Secondly, the gift that you have received is rooted in God's grace towards you. The word for gift is the same, comes from the same root word as the Greek word for grace. It's an act of mercy that God has gifted you spiritually. Now, these are not natural gifts. We all have natural gifts and abilities. Some of us have sharp intellect. Some of us have physical abilities that others don't. Those are natural gifts. These are not, this is not here a reference to natural gifts. This is a reference to spiritual gifts. Oftentimes, people in the church confuse spiritual gifts with natural gifts. Spiritual gifts is a gift that God has given you that uniquely brings glory to God because you're supernaturally able to do something that other people aren't able to do. We'll talk more about what those gifts are in just a minute. But thirdly, I'd like you to note verse 9 or verse 10, as each one has received a special gift, notice, employ it in serving who? It's not for you. <laughs> employ it in serving what? One another. The reason why God has given you a gift is because the church that He has placed you in needs you to function with that gift. In fact, skip down and notice in verse 10 the manifold grace of God. Do you see that word manifold? It literally means multicolored. God has given so many unique gifts, spiritual gifts, that it makes us this multicolored tapestry that maximizes the glory to God. By the way, that's why when you casually leave a church, what you're doing when you sinfully leave a church, you're disrupting the multicolored beauty that God intends in that particular place to bring glory to Him. Notice, gifts are for the church, but also notice this, and we could say maybe this is where the whole sermon was driving to, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Do you see that word steward? You know what that means? It means you're going to be held accountable for how you used your gift to the church. Why in the world would we focus on the church when we know that Jesus is returning? The answer? Because when Jesus comes, He's going to hold you accountable to how you served His church. 
Did you use the gift that he has given you to build up his body? We're stewards. We're stewards of the gift. How do I know I'm a preacher? It's not because I can eloquently wax uh, wax words together. You know I can't. I'm more like a bull in a china shop. But it's because as I speak, and if I'm speaking the words of God, meaning I'm expositing Scripture, people get saved or they get sanctified. But it's not because Ryan is so great or Ryan's doing everything right. It's a spiritual gift that results in glory to God, and people shouldn't turn around and say, well, Ryan's such a great teacher. People should turn around and say, Jesus is such a great God because today I learned a new truth about him. Notice verse 10, or 11. Whoever speaks is to do so at the one speaking the utterances of God, and whoever serves is to do so by serving uh, with the strength which God supplies. Verse 11 classifies spiritual gifts into two categories. There are two types of gifts. Mark this. There are speaking gifts and serving gifts. Now, if you want to go jump into spiritual gifts, you can look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Romans chapter 12. There's two lists. And you can go through the spiritual gifts and start asking the self, yourself the question, what gift do you have? If you have a speaking gift, preaching or teaching, or both, your job is to do so as if you were speaking the very utterances of God. Meaning, don't get up there and, and show everybody how great of a speaker you are. But you need to uh, clarify God's word, preach God's word, herald God's word for the purpose of God being glorified. If you have a gift that's a serving gift, you need to serve God with the strength in which God has provided you to accomplish that so that God will be glorified in everything, whether it's a speaking gift or serving gift, God will be glorified. Which leads us to our third point. You're like, really? I thought we were done. We are. It's going to give you the point, the purpose. The purpose is to bring glory to God. Listen, brothers and sisters, Jesus is returning. His return is sure. And he is going to hold you accountable. Listen, he's not just going to hold Pastor Ryan accountable for the things that he says, which he is. Scripture tells us, let not many of you become teachers because teachers are held with the stricter judgment. I am a steward of the gift that God has given me and I will be held accountable for the things that I say. But listen, mark my words, so will you. You will be held accountable, maybe not for the things that you say in a teaching capacity, but you will be held accountable for what you have done with the gift that God has given you. You and I are stewards of a gift. He's coming back. Are we employing those gifts knowing that he's coming soon? It's a great question to ask ourselves. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you again for reminding us of how we are to conduct ourselves in your house. And we pray that you would use us to bring you glory. Thank you uh, for gathering us together to dive into your word and reminding us of things that we need to be reminded of. As aliens and strangers Lord, we are so thankful for your church. We feel suffering and persecution from the world as the world maligns us. We find comfort in the love that we give to one another and the hospitality that we give to one another. Lord, may we find hospitality in the church that is lacking in the world. May we find love in the church that we don't really receive from the world. Lord, we thank you for the care that you provide us with in the church, that you surrounded us with people that that overlook our transgressions sometimes. And we thank you that you've surrounded us with people that that are constantly opening their homes and, and the things that they have to bless us. And Lord, we recognize that you've also gifted us and you've called us to serve others. Lord, for those that are here that don't know how you've gifted them, we pray that you would show them. Thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.